Hello, everyone. Welcome to yet another session of our NPTEL on nonlinear and adaptive control. I am Srikant Sukumar from Systems and Control, IIT Bombay. We are, as always, in front of our nice motivational image of this uh, autonomously operating rover on Mars. And uh, we sort of uh, are advancing towards uh, analyzing and developing algorithms that uh, we hope will drive systems such as these. So last time uh, we were looking at the notion of radial unboundedness, right? We had started with um, these uh, special functions, right? Which we are going to uh, use subsequently in Lyapunov theorems and the first a property that we looked at was the property of definiteness. So we looked at positive definite functions. Um, and then last time we were looking at uh, radial unbounded functions in some detail. So as uh, always, we sort of uh, gave some uh, you know definition for radial unboundedness, which is sort of an extension of uh, positive definite functions. And we, just like in the case of positive definite functions, we also proposed some easier tests for verifying radial unboundedness, right? So just like the uh, case of positive definite functions, and the definition itself may not uh, be amenable for use in a lot of cases. And so we um, sort of used some, uh, came up with some easy tests because the definitions themselves uh, require us to come up with some class K and some class K R, functions, right? Which may not always be easy to find. Uh, so of course, also for the case of radial unboundedness, we came up with this easier conditions, right? And we saw uh, some pretty, uh, hopefully some pretty good representative examples. Of course, the exercises that uh, we are uh, providing um, have more of these examples and uh, more of these examples that you have to consider and discuss definiteness and unboundedness, etc. for. All right. So this was the notion of radial unboundedness, right? So we also uh, pointed out that uh, positive definiteness was connected to local stability notions and radial unboundedness is connected to global stability notions. Right. This is again something that we will see subsequently. Now, um, there is also, you know, if you go back and uh, sort of remember the definitions that we had looked at, we also looked at the notion of uniform stability, right? And this uniform stability notions are what are connected to um, decrescence. All right. So that is what we are going to look at today. So this is where we start. We say this lecture 4.3, this third lecture of the fourth week. Right? And we want to define what is a decrescent function. Okay. So if we, as always, we have a scalar valued function, which is uh, going to take as its arguments time. And again, uh, just like we mentioned last time, there is really no harm. In fact, it might even be better to assume that this function takes non-negative real time because that's really that's what we are going to consider um, almost everywhere in this course. And in fact, most courses in nonlinear control. Right. So uh, this is a function which takes in the first argument time r plus and the second argument as state which is now in some bounded ball around the origin so this is br we are we have already introduced this notation and as usual it maps to reals so all these functions are have a similar range and domain right uh, and of course we require that vt0 be equal to 0 for all t in r plus this is again the same condition as before remember that we really care about 
this function taking zero values at the origin, right? Because um, origin is where we want to convert, and this has the notion of some kind of an energy function, and uh, we want this energy to be uh, to take its minimum value, right? When you are at this equilibrium, right? Which is the origin. So for decrescent, the second condition that we require is the existence of a class K function such that absolute value of V dx is less than or equal to phi norm x for all t in R plus and for all x in Br, right? So this is, you know, sort of completely opposite to what we saw for uh, positive definiteness in some sense, right? So at least it looks like it's completely opposite to uh, what we saw for positive definiteness. Right. So, what's the idea? It has to be dominated by a class K function. Okay. So, if, if you look at the picture, this should help us identify the difference. Here we have X and here, of course, we have all the, the different functions of X so that we will sort of mark later on. So, this is say my So this is say my class K function. I mean, I mean, again, this is only until some R beyond that uh, we don't care. I mean, so this is just some class K function, right? And what we want is that, in fact, yeah, let me, uh, yeah, let me sort of draw it in a different way. So to indicate that I can, in fact, go below it. Oh, no. Let's see. Let me. So we want this v absolute value of v to be less, right? So of course, what I will do is I will draw something on the other end too. Something like this, and we want. So this this blue thing is of course the phi norm x and this is minus phi norm x and we want the v to be bounded inside this so we want so v is allowed to go in the negative direction but it has to remain within this uh, sort of envelope if you may right so this is what is a decrescent function I and mean, this is an example of a decrescent function right? so this is an example of a decrescent function okay so uh, as i mentioned before decrescence is related to the notion of uniform stability right? so um, basically it's somehow uh, if you look at this well i mean it's not evident here but anyway i mean it, it, essentially there is some kind of an independence with respect to time that you achieve using the notion of decrescence okay so um, so, uh, what are the examples? So, let's look at examples and counter examples just like we have been doing. So, let's see. Let me try to expand this and say, look at some, some example one. Right? What is it? Um, suppose I take something like Vtx is equal to. Um, what we took for the positive definite case let's try to see that so this was t plus 1 over 2 uh, times norm of x squared right i mean you can always also take norm of x squared divided by 1 plus norm of x squared so that's fine so we know that this is a positive definite so v positive definite we have already sort of discussed this a couple of times before Right, because this is of course greater than or equal to uh, this guy for all non-negative time right so it's positive definite but is it decrescent right? no it's not decrescent right because there's no way i can uh you know so this is sort of not very easy to argue again because we are not giving any easy test in this case right uh, so it's not very easy to argue so we want to claim is ask if v is less than or equal to i mean this is already non-negative so i'm not using absolute value of u 
So is B less than or equal to some phi norm x? Like, let's think of a simple situation. Let's say is this true? Is this true for some positive gamma? Right? What do you folks think? So I have essentially taken this guy out. And I'm saying does this inequality hold true for some gamma? Because if it does, obviously this right hand side is a class K function. Right? And so we are done. I mean, uh, well, fine. The right hand side is not exactly a class K function, but the right hand side is a positive definite function. Right? So we are fine. We are sort of, you know, it's not, uh, you know, not a big deal. Right? Because I can always say that this is, uh, uh, let's see, less than, okay, I apologize. I can always sort of say that this is less than or equal to gamma norm x squared and then I'm done. Okay, because gamma norm x squared is of course a class k function, right? In fact, in fact, it is a class k r function, right? So that's okay. Class k r function is also a class k function, okay? But does this even hold true? Does this hold true? Yeah. So the point is uh, this guy. I'm going to put a nice square around it. So this is not, uh, let's see, I'm sorry, not true. Why? Why is this not true? If you give me any gamma, for example, say gamma is 100. Okay, if you give me a really large gamma, say gamma equal to 100, I choose some arbitrary large gamma. What do I know? I know that uh, at t greater than 99, right, v tx becomes greater than gamma norm x squared divided by 1 plus norm x squared. Okay, and I immediately get a contradiction, right? And it was so easy. I got a contradiction, see it very, very easy, right? And so if you give me any uh, choice of gamma, arbitrarily large, it doesn't matter. I can always find a T says that it will start to dominate this function rather than being less than this function. It in fact starts to dominate this function. And that is a problem, right? And so you can see that this is not decrescent right so this is uh, this v is not decrescent right so this is positive definite but it is not decrescent okay so let's look at another example and right? say uh, say the other way around suppose i take v uh, tx yeah, I'm going to make it bigger. Suppose I take my second example with V T X as equal to, um, I sort of divide, right? So suppose I take one over two T plus one, um, non X squared divided by one plus non X squared. In fact, I'll keep my life simple and I'll just get rid of this guy okay. and just say it's norm x squared because anyway it doesn't matter whether it's positive definite or radially unbounded okay because we are more concerned with decrescence here right. what can i say what can i say i know that this is for sure less than norm x squared over 2 for all t greater than for all t in r plus Right, because as t becomes larger than zero, this is definitely smaller than norm x squared by two. Right, that's obvious. So implies decrescence. Right, implies decrescence. 
sorry. Okay, but, but V not positive definite, right? Why? Let's look at the easier condition. Let's look at the easier condition. What do we require? We require V to be strictly positive for all uh, norm X not equal to zero. Okay. On the face of it, it looks like it, right? But if I take any non-zero X, right? The problem is I have division by T plus one, this guy. Yeah. So what happens? Uh, again, I'll say no. So let limit as t goes to infinity 1 over 2 t plus 1 norm x squared is 0. And it doesn't matter what norm x is, it is irrelevant. It is irrelevant what norm x is. All right, as I push t larger and larger, this is going to go to zero. Therefore, V is not positive definite, right? So we have some sort of um, contradictory examples, right? We found that for uh, when, you know, sort of I give you an example where if it was a function of state and time, where V was a function of state and time, and uh, it was decrescent, like this case here, it turned out that it was not positive definite, right? Because if it was upper bounded by a class K function, I could not lower bound it by a class K function. Right? I mean, I did not really see it in terms of lower bounding class K, but I did the equivalent easier test. Right? On the other hand, if whenever I could lower bound it by a, cla uh, by a class K function, right, like this, this is, uh, you know, whenever I could uh, prove that it was positive definite, right, which we did already in the previous lectures, we could show that it was not decrescent, right? right? Of course, in this case, we only showed with a particular example of a, you know, class K function. We could have said that it is dominated, it's upper bound by some very large class K function, but the point is whatever function of x I choose here. Remember that the right hand side has to be independent of time. So whatever function of states I choose, right, this has to be true for all x, notice. So if I choose really small x, then this is right hand side is potentially not very big. But as I keep pushing my time up and up and up, vtx is always going to dominate something like this any function of only the state on the right hand side okay so although i chose this particular example to verify that it's not decrescent it doesn't matter i could have chosen any function of state here and this would always dominate this guy as t gets pushed up as t sorry as t goes to infinity right so this was not decrescent so the example where I had positive definiteness, I did not get decrescence. The example where I got decrescence, I did not get positive definiteness. So it begs the question, is there an example of a, does there even exist an example of a um, V, which is function of both T and X, which is both decrescent and positive definiteness, right? So the answer is yes, yeah. The answer is yes, it's not that difficult. and what is it? We'll of course first choose the nice positive definite sort of structure. Let's see. I'll choose something like this. I will keep a norm x squared over to here. And what I will do is I will take something like a, uh, a bounded function of time if you may. And I'll take a bounded function of time. So this is something like 1 plus sine squared t. Right? So what do I know about this Vtx? I know that Vtx is definitely greater than or equal to norm x squared by 2 implies V positive definite right? because I could find lower bounding class K function. Why this is true is because 
the lowest value this can take is zero largest value is of course one but the lowest value is zero right and so it dominates this class k function okay simple so this becomes one so now i also know that this has a largest value the largest value this can take is two because sine squared t is upper bounded at one right and so this whole thing can at most become two right so i i also know that vtx is upper bounded by non x squared implies v is also decrescent It's upper bounded by x squared. Why? Because the largest value this can take is 2. So the 2 and 2 here cancel, and that's the largest possible value of this function. Right? So I have bounds on both sides. So there do exist, of course, functions of both state and time, which are in fact both decrescent and positive definiteness. Positive definite, right? So it's not like you know one excludes the other or something like that. Okay, let's not um I hope we are not, you know, sort of getting into this preconceived notion that one does not mean the other. Because if that was the case, then it would never be possible to get uniform stability and, uh, you know, asymptotic stability together, right? As we will see further. So now the other thing to remember, of course, is that uh, if you have a function, yeah, which is actually just a function of the state. Right. So this is obviously positive definite. So in such cases, only so I'll in fact make a remark also. Remark if V only dependent on X then decrescence is free. Yeah, it's trivially decrescent right? because of course it's upper bounded by norm x squared. It's upper bounded by norm x squared and I'm done. Right? So it's trivially decrescent because there's no time appearing which will not allow this domination. Okay, I hope that's clear. Then the final property, which is the actually a rather weak property, is that of positive semi-definiteness. Okay. So the positive defi semi-definiteness is a rather simple property. It just says that you know anything um, if as usual if you have a function going from time to the state, and of course we want v t0 to be zero. Further, if the function is just non-negative, just takes non-negative values. Okay, that's all we need for semi definiteness. If the function v takes non negative values for all values of time and state in a ball, then v is said to be positive definite, semi definite, and it is denoted by a greater than or equal to zero. Okay, so positive definiteness was denoted greater than zero, so positive semi definite is denoted greater than or equal to zero. Right, so these are rather simple functions basically, any function taking a non negative value. Right, so it means so so many examples. So v t x equals t x one square plus x two square is fine, is greater than or equal to zero. Uh, v t x equal to x one squared by two plus x one squared by four, which was not positive definite. Remember is in fact positive semi-definite because in a, whatever happens this is never going to take a negative value right similarly if i uh, choose v all the examples that did not satisfy our other properties yeah this is again positive semi-definite because whatever happens this function is never going to take a negative value and remember that positive semi-definite uh, semi-definiteness also plays a important role in Lyapunov stability theorems. So it's not a, a class that is to be taken lightly. Yeah, but of course it is a rather weak requirement. Yeah? It just requires that the function itself never take a non-negative value. Yeah, that's it. That's all we require in positive semi-definiteness. All right.
all right i hope uh, that all made sense so beyond this we are of course ready to look at the lyapunov theorems uh, look at the lyapunov theorem but we will stop here and sort of uh, try to conclude a discussion for this session so what is it that we saw uh, we went on to sort of look at the final property if you may and this is the property of decrescence so we have seen three properties uh, of functions which is positive definiteness connected to asymptotic stability um, radial unboundedness which we said is connected to global asymptotic stability and decrescence which we have mentioned is connected to uniform stability right so you've seen all the three properties um, in this week's lectures we've also seen uh, you know a good number of examples to hopefully help us distinguish between these properties right so i really hope that it helps clarifies what kinds of functions are positive definite and which are end positive definite right so it's more important to sort of remember the ones that are not positive definite yeah so we don't make any errors in our lyapunov uh, theorem applications okay um, and of course um, uh, these are rather nice potential functions and we will see uh, subsequently the setup for the lyapunov theorems and we will also see how these uh, three properties of function that we have uh, defined we have looked at easier tests to actually talk about these uh, to actually verify these uh, definitions uh, so we will actually see how these three uh, kinds or classes of functions uh, play a pivotal role in uh, helping us state the lyapunov theorems and right? so this will be rather critical in what is going to come in next right so yeah so i mean uh, what's upcoming in the um, lectures now is what is the most most critical aspect aspect of uh, nonlinear control uh, which is the lyapunov stability theorems and which is what helps us uh, to conclude that a system or an autonomous system such as what we see in the background it performs uh, satisfactory in any given environment right so that it uh, that it uh, you know follows a given trajectory or reaches a particular point or has a particular orientation so all of these are uh, posed as stability questions by control engineers and nonlinear control theorists verify these uh, using the lyapunov stability theorem so what we will see subsequently are probably one of the most uh, seminal results in nonlinear systems analysis. All right, excellent. Uh, so that's where we will stop today, uh, and I hope to see you again soon next time. Thank you. Mm -hmm.